Good morning, everyone. This is a session to look at the creation of maps and you know, run through the steps to create a simple map of the Ashfield Flats Preserve and to show you again quickly how to add some data to that. So I've got our studio open here at the moment, as you can see, and we need a couple of packages to get started. So I'm going to open the package. Open street map. And so I'll run that. And I'm also going to open the package. Pretty map R. Oops. Okay. Now, pretty map R just gives us nice map annotations, such as a uh, north arrow symbol and scale bar. Pretty important components of maps. Uh, and then we are going to use one of the functions within OpenStreetMap. And that's called open map to make a map object and that function should be available to us straight away um, but we need to put some coordinates in so first of all we're going to put uh, the coordinates in as two vectors and the first one is the top left or northwest corner of the map and the easiest way to get those coordinates is just to flick across to Google Maps and find where we need to go. So we're going to head upstream in the Swan River until we get to about the right spot. There's Ron Courtney Island and there we go. There's Ashfield Flats. All right. So remember that our samples are taken along the drains and uh, a few samples round about there so if we just make that a little bit bigger i'm going to identify a spot that will give us the northwest corner of our map so it needs to come across to about here and we sampled in this area so about this street corner here of mons and margaret street will take that as our northwest corner and if i right click on google maps and say what's here it'll tell me where I am, but it also importantly give me coordinates and that's in the exact form that we need. Now, what we can also do is um, click on that. And the reason why I do that is it lets me from the, the address box up there, copy those coordinates, right? So that I can flick back to our commander and I can just pop those in. Now. You don't have to keep all those decimal places if you don't want to, but it, it doesn't matter if you do. Okay, uh, so I might use a few less just to tidy things up. So I'm just going to round them to four decimal places. And then I'm going to go back to Google Maps and look for my southeast coordinate. So what I need to do is to zoom back out again and figure out where the bottom right corner of the map is going to be. And I would estimate, given that we took some water samples along here and so on, uh, that we might want to put the, the corner maybe about there. So I'm going to do the same thing. Right click what's here and then click on those coordinates, which lets me copy that information from the address bar. Go back in. Pop it in. So there's our coordinates, and again, just for the sake of keeping things a little bit tidy, I'm going to have fewer decimal places in. And there's probably uh, that that is all that we need to do as a minimum, uh, apart from tell uh, where to put that map. And we're going to make uh, a, a map object. I'm going to call it AFR for Ashfield Flats Reserve, and I'm actually going to call it dot osm to remind me that it's an open street map object we'll just put a carriage return in there so that we can see all the code and i'm going to run that you know what i did there case sensitivity so try run again so you can see down in the, the console, it's taking some time to pull the information off the OpenStreetMap server. And we haven't specified any other options here. So we're just going to get the default 
open street map, map style. There are ways of getting other map styles um, and uh, you can look at some of those within the open street map help. Okay, now that's finished and I'm just gonna leave it there for now and we'll have a look at plotting it. Okay, so the plot command is a generic uh, function within R. So it looks at what it's trying to plot, plot and then creates the right type of plot for it. Okay, and you can, so the plot afr.osm and let's just see what happens if we plot that without adding any other parameters to them. Okay, so the, there's the area, basically the area that we want. I'm not sure that the default OpenStreetMap style is the most attractive, uh, but notice that we've got not a lot of space in there to put axes in, and I suggest that we do need some axes on the graphs to indicate what coordinate system that we're using. So I'm going to edit that um, and put remove margin equals false, okay, and then run that again, and then I'm going to get a slightly different iteration of it. Now, what I probably should have done there before, some of you will remember this, is set some more attractive um, plot margins. Let's just make, oops, 44 would be a bit extreme. 4411 and run those two lines again. And that should pop out the map a little bit bigger and leave the space at the, the left and the bottom for some axes. Now, with Plotting maps, we have to put our axes in separately, right? So I'm going to put axis one. So these go from the bottom in clockwise order. One, two, three, four. So we need axis one and two. Uh, so just put those lines in, select them and run them, right? Now, I showed you this on purpose because it doesn't look that flash right now because we've got these coordinate systems which are actually internal coordinates for the open street map system and they don't really represent anything that we're familiar with they're not latitude longitude and they're not utm so what we actually need to do is convert our map object to the projection that we want to do so we need to use another function all right so what i'm going to do is insert a line here and i'm going to say afr dot UTM. So again, putting some information in there, make another object where I remind myself of the coordinate system that I'm using, and I'm using now the function open proj, open projection. All right, so and the input for that will be this map object. If we just leave it like that, we get latitude, longitude, but of course, in our field data, we've collected. UTM coordinates, so we need to convert it to a UTM. So we actually need to specify the projection explicitly, and we need a special character string here. I'm just gonna, it's gonna go over the line, so I'm gonna put it here. Um, and there's a very particular syntax that we need to use, okay. That sets us up in the UTM coordinate system in the space. Got a plus sign zone equals 50. So we're in UTM zone 50. Let's delete some of the nifty nice formatting that's in R. And the last thing we need to do is tell uh, OpenStreetMap that we're in the southern hemisphere. All right, so we should now be able to run that line and it will create another object called afr.utm. Let's see what happens. Okay. So you can imagine there's quite a lot of calculation going on there. It's got to convert every coordinate and to UTM now from the OpenStreetMap system, but it's done it. Okay, so if we edit our map coordinates run our map again we should get some coordinates on it that look a little bit more sensible and they do okay i'm just going to make that a little bit bigger so what what you'll notice is that the, the map is not quite touching the axes 
uh, and we can fiddle around with the width and height of the plotting window to make that happen. Right? And the final thing that you might like to do for a map is to put a box in. The default box is usually OK. So run that line and we get a box around there. What, what you do notice is that on the map it's slightly uh, rotated. Now that's just a function of the UTM projection. So the UTM projection is rectangles. Uh, and of course the slices of the earth taper towards the poles so we've got slightly different shapes to work with uh, and then depending on where you are in the, rec the UTM rectangle you'll get rotation one way or the other it doesn't matter so don't don't worry too much about that okay so there's a good basic map that we can start to work with the only other thing that we notice that we don't have any access titles at this stage so we're going to need to put them in with something called the m text or margin text function uh, so let's do the bottom axis side equals one. We need to say how far from the axis to put it. I usually use line equals two or something like that, two lines away from the axis. And uh, text equals in quotes, uh, should be this is easting um, UTM zone 50 units of meters right and that's about a minimum uh, just to make sure we can see everything and I'll make it font equals to bold right um, that should do us for now so let's have a look what happens when we run that it was going to do nothing for a minute so if we want a, a y-axis title let's copy that and paste it again, make it side equals two, change easting to northing and run that. And then we've got quite reasonable axes. Okay. So that, that gets us a little way towards starting. We've we've made our base map and it would be quite handy now to use some of the functions within pretty map R to add some of the annotations on the map okay so there's one called add north arrow okay and we can just use the default for that and let's see what it looks like we run that that's well, not too bad right you've got a north arrow sitting up there at the top right and the other thing that we can use is a function called add scale bar and the default is okay but we need to include some indication of the projection that we're using and the place on earth because both of those will make a difference to the way that the scale bar is calculated um, so there's this odd parameter called plot I think I spelled that incorrectly prop plot EPSG okay and we need to give that a number and this is our number 28350 for UTM zone 50 in the southern hemisphere believe it or not okay and we'll just accept the default parameters otherwise and run that and there's our scale bar so that, that's okay and we can fiddle about with some of them if you want to read the help file some of the other parameters in there to make it look different but that, that's okay as far as I'm concerned at the moment now the last thing that we would want to do would be to add some data right so we we know that um, we have spatial information in our data sets so I, I think I've um, got and the we use the function points to add points to a map and let's put uh, points for water in. I'm hoping that they're in here. Actually, I might just check my, my data objects because it would be a bit of a shame if I didn't have. All right, so that's going to be a bit of an issue. Um, so I'll tell you what we'll do. We will grab Excel already open for something else and open a file in it all right now um, no 
actual fact we'll use the sediment soil data because that's that's there right and i will select all of the values in there and copy them from excel this is quite a funky way of getting data into our studio all right and i'll run it in my script file because i'm not quite sure how it goes Okay, so I'm going to say AFS19 and put that into put into that. Use read table, uh, and where I'm getting the information for from is the clipboard. I just copied it into the clipboard from Excel, and say so header equals true. T for true is okay. Uh, and the separator is equal to a tab, so backslash T. That ought to do it. Let's see what happens. Run that. Okay, seem to run all right. If we use our studio's built in viewer, we should be able to see if it worked. So it does seem to. So we've got our headers in, that all works. Importantly, we have Eastings and Northings. So that's that's pretty cool. And we've also got the group numbers. So that group has come in as you'd expect it to as numeric. What I would prefer it came in to do is a factor. So I'll just say if that's $19 group and put into that a coercion to a factor, the same thing. AFS $19 group, All right? That ought to work. Okay. Now, close that. Open it again. And our group is a factor with 10 levels. Perfecto. That will become useful later on. Okay. Now, what do we do with that? So we were starting to add points. Uh, so I actually need to change it to an S because that's what I call my data object. And I'm going to plot Easting and AFS $19 Northing. And let's be a little bit fancy. So plot character equals three. I know that's a across. Actually, putting these on separate lines for a reason for later on, and the color equals red, for instance. Okay, now if we run that, we get our points. Okay, so we could have been a little bit smarter in uh, choosing our coordinates. We probably needed to go a little bit further over towards the east. So let's let's do that now while we still. Are able to. Um, so what we want is this corner here. This is our southeast corner. We want it to go a little bit further over, right? So instead of 0.9474, let's uh, make it 0.955. Just say, so, all right. Uh, and if we run those two things again, in fact, let's run the whole shebang. Why not? We wait. We see what happens when it replots. While one waits, one pours a cup of coffee. As you do. Okay, it's still pulling the data off the server now. Won't be too long until that's finished. So it's now making the UTM map, once it's finished doing the conversion, it'll be quite quick to do the rest of the functions. Here we go. All right, so I made it way too wide, but you, you get the idea. Let's pull that across to resize the, the raster image behind the map. Nearly, all right. Um, I 
Okay, just just to make it look tidy. Move Andrew over so we can resize that a bit. Sorry, mate. Um, and we need to pull this up. So, look, being way too fussy here. And I would actually just run that again because we've lost our scale bar and the resizing process and the north arrow. Actually, no. I don't want to do that. I just wanted to plot it again. Okay, so there we have it. A quite creditable map. Now, what it hasn't done, of course, is to give us an indication of which um, samples are which which group, for example. So we we can do that. We can uh, play around with our code, and that's why I've put this on um, different lines. So let, instead of having just a single plot character, let's make plot char a character sequence from zero to nine. Uh, by default, it goes up in steps of one. What does that do? Well, let's run it and see what it does. So it just gives us numbers from zero to nine. Uh, and according to what AFS 19 dollar group, the factor that we just made sure was a factor. All right. Uh, and we can do the same thing with colors, actually. Um, so why don't we do that? Uh, sequence one to ten because I don't think there is a color zero and we may not have ten colors in our palette however but let's give it a go okay so we want to select everything up to there and run it all right so the colour's pretty shocking, especially the cyan, which is really hard to see. But that's all right. We've we've got, and some of the colours have started to repeat. I think the palette's only got eight colours, so some of the groups, oh, there's group eight here actually has got very pale grey, which is really hard to see. It is there, I promise. But then we started to recycle colours again. So group nine got the same colour as group one, and group. 10 got the same color as group 2 because we only have eight colors to play with. So you, you could do that a little differently, right? Um, how would we do that? We'd make our own color palette. Okay. There are various ways of doing this palette. Um, we'll put into it. Have a look at this thing. Rainbow. around that so that we can have black as our first color it's kind of nice uh, just see if that actually works there we go so there's we'll see see what it does yeah you can change the parameters in there but you didn't know that i had a function called rainbow did you all right, so we run that again. We've got slightly different colors, but they're still a bit pale, but at least we've got a different color for each thing. Yeah. So we can we can change some of that um, rainbow nine and we'll put B, so the value of the color equals 0 0.7, makes them a bit darker. And remember, we've got a button here to rerun everything. We'll try that, see what happens, and that, that looks a little bit easier to see so we're starting to get places and the last thing of course you put in would be a legend where's a good place for legend looks like bottom right over there so we'll say that bottom right legend equals and we just need to we'll put everything on separate lines so we can see them legend equals the levels in our factor 
Okay. Remember that we said plot colors. Uh, sorry, plot characters. Now this colors are these. And that gets us a basic legend that you can play with. So I'll just run that, and make sure I've done everything okay. And there it is. So it looks a bit nasty. So like actually, we'll say number of columns in the legend equals two, and run the whole thing again. And there we are. Okay. So we probably ought to put a uh, title on the legend, I'm thinking, just to make sure that it's clear what it's referring to. Um, and that would just about do it. I'm just going to cheat a little bit and just run that line by itself and have it overplot the legend. And there we go. So, could be helpful, huh?